So thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, happy Black History Month. Uh, really excited about this conversation. My name is Samir Youssef. I'm a chief of staff at Black VC. We have some incredible panelists for y'all today. Uh, the discussion focused on uh, Black Wealth Matters, the history of Black Wall Street, entrepreneurship and venture capital. Um, and Nia, the, the uh, moderator will dive into her background and, and all the, everybody will make their introductions, but just wanted to quickly make sure everybody was aware of, you know, uh, as Black VC, we're, this is a new series that we're trying to start. Uh, as you all know, the kind of impetus behind uh, why Black VC exists, the connection to why it matters that there are more Black venture investors is ultimately to increase the amount of wealth uh, circulating within the Black community for Black entrepreneurs, uh, Black tech employees, Black people broadly. So really this is the start of that series to start to make that connection and show how we as Black VC hope to continue to push the, uh, the creation of Black wealth within our communities. And obviously, you know, today, this year, um, all that's happened last year, but also all that's happened over the past hundred years, dating back to the Tulsa race massacre, it's really important to have this conversation and uh, kind of embed and look back and see where we've come and, and where we can go. So with that, um, I'll go ahead and introduce Nia Ham. She's a Boston-based uh, reporter, as well as the founder of the podcast, Dreams of Black Wall Street, and I'll let her take it from there. And I will unmute myself. Thank you so much, Tamar. Um, I really do appreciate it. And I'm so excited to be here. And I've got actually so much great feedback from a lot of folks who've been sharing this event. So I really appreciate um, all of you who have uh, tuned in to join us today. So as uh, Samer said, I am a Boston-based TV reporter. I work for the NBC Boston affiliate there, and uh, I do that in my day job. And then also, as Summer said, I produce and host a podcast called Dreams of Black Wall Street, uh, which focuses on early enterprising Black communities. Uh, it's sort of in that period following Reconstruction in what is known as the Nadir of American Race Relations. And so I just think it's a re really fascinating time period. And uh, that is, I guess, why I'm here, because my first season focused on uh, Tulsa and sort of used the Tulsa Race Massacre as a lens into the experience of Black people in Tulsa and Oklahoma in general. And so um, I am also joined by uh, Stephanie Creary. She is the Assistant Professor at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. She is an identity and diversity scholar and field researcher and Assistant Professor of Management at the Wharton School and an affiliated faculty member of Wharton People Analytics uh, and has organized, uh, and rather as an organized scholar, Dr. Query investigates how people effectively navigate identity related tensions and boundaries at work, particularly around issues of inclusion and exclusion. She studies these dynamics in a variety of organizations, including global firms and corporate boardrooms. Dr. Creary has published her research in top academic journals and regularly shares her research and applied insights with industry audiences and the media. Dr. Creary has earned a BS and MS degrees from the Boston University, uh, Sargent College of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences, an MBA from the Simmons School of Management and MS and PhD degrees from the Boston College Carroll School of Management. It's a lot of degrees. Um, we are also joined by A. Donahue Baker. He is uh, a co-founder of Money Avenue LLC, a fintech digital bank whose ultimate mission is to bring wealth building practices to the masses. Um, he plans to accomplish that mission in stages and each stage delivers a significant value proposition to uh, the community it serves the first stage. Uh, and the current business model is designed to put many pawn shops and payday lenders out of business. The company aims to disrupt predatory lending practices that have left many Americans in debt. Money Ave also currently does this by making low interest short term personal loans available to individuals in as little as three hours via an app. And so the company operates in both the personal uh, financing space as well as the B2B space funding individuals and businesses alike. Uh, so he, uh, I should also say, is a um, music producer, I won't say former, but is also a music producer, um, an investor, and a real estate expert. And then finally, uh, we are joined by Melissa Bradley. She's the founder of Eureka. And she's the, actually the co-founder of the Venture Back to Eureka, a community where small businesses gain unprecedented access to expertise needed to grow their business. 
and her, their Eureka mission is to democratize economic opportunity by enabling community and by reducing the cost and risk associated with growing a small to medium business. She's also founder of the 1863 Ventures a Business Development Program that excels, accelerates new majority entrepreneurs from high potential to high growth. Okay. So we have obviously a very impressive and esteemed uh, group of panelists. Um, Samar, I think you asked me earlier if I would be interested in sharing my screen and I would. So if that capability is uh, possible um, or if you have to enable that, if you could do so now, I would appreciate it. You should be able to now. Okay, thank you so much. I do appreciate that. Uh, and so uh, what I'm going to do now at this portion of the presentation is just give a little bit of background because we're using Tulsa as a jumping off point during this conversation to talk about how these uh, really important and significant historic uh, uh, events uh, such as the Tulsa Race Massacre have impacted our communities today. And so um, just a, a 10 minute, <laughs> hopefully I can squeeze all of this in. Um, brief introduction and you know for those of you who are, who are familiar with this um then just a refresher on the Tulsa race massacre so i'm now sharing my screen as you can see here um so uh black wall street what is black wall street so black wall street is sort of the uh nickname given to what uh was or currently actually still is the predominantly black greenwood district in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And I'll get into how it, it got its name a little uh, later. Uh, but the reason you know it is significant and probably that we're talking about it today is because of a terrible tragedy that occurred there about a century ago, exactly a century ago this year, uh, in which you know the Oklahoma Historical Society calls it the single worst incident of racial violence in American history. Um, it claimed many lives and left the entire community uh, of Tulsa decimated. This was a pretty prosperous community relative to the time period. And I try to explain to people that it didn't just happen in a vacuum. There were a lot of um, racial tensions that were brewing both in Oklahoma and in the nation in general at the time. And uh, a lot of this goes back to prior to statehood uh, of Oklahoma when it was still a territory um, and it was actually called Indian Territory at the time. And this is a time period, I guess, where you could say what was called the five civilized tribes, certain tribes or Native American uh, nations um, sort of came to this territory with some of their slaves that they brought with them uh, during the displacement of a lot of these natives from their original homelands. And then after slavery was over, you had a lot of folks coming into the uh, area as well, because this was a unchartered territory, but also opportunity for folks to create a homestead and really make a life and uh, have a livelihood for themselves and their families. And so, Oklahoma was really considered during this period a promised land in large part because of all of the oil that was discovered in Oklahoma towards the end of the 19th century and early in the 20th century. A lot of people really considered it um, uh, Uncharted territory, but also it was desirable in that it was in the in an area of the country that had not been settled the way other areas had. So a lot of uh, African American people coming from Texas and other surrounding uh, states would settle in this area because there were opportunities here that they were not necessarily able to find elsewhere and not just African Americans, obviously wherever there's money, there's gonna be a lot of people, right? So you had folks coming really from all over the United States uh, trying to get in on this drilling industry um, that was happening. African Americans were not allowed to directly participate in the oil industry, but they benefited from a lot of the jobs that were created as a result of the booming uh, business that the oil industry was at the time. And so a lot of uh, African Americans, some of them were called boosters. They were actually advertising Oklahoma as a desirable, desirable place to live and come and settle. And also as a place where they didn't have to worry about their life and safety the way they did in other places, especially the Jim Crow South at the time. 
And so uh, later on, after uh, a lot of Blacks and you had a lot of Black people, you had a lot of Native American people, obviously you had some Europeans and some white people, everybody was kind of coming into this area. And it was an interesting dynamic because yes, racism was still very prevalent. They had a lot of different people and cultures living in um, this area at the same time. Interestingly enough, Oklahoma was home at the time to the largest number of all black communities and municipalities in the United States during this time, about 50, uh, if I'm not mistaken. <clears throat> and Tulsa, uh, the Greenwood neighborhood of Tulsa um, specifically was one of those communities. And so obviously education was a really big important um, issue for a lot of African Americans. Literacy rates definitely increased um, during and following reconstruction. And a lot of black people considered education as a, a path towards up mo upward mobility, but again, also plenty of job opportunities. And uh, this was a time where you had some of America's first black communities being created and some of America's first black millionaires also um, finding success in a number of different fields. And some of these uh, gentlemen you see in the picture are considered some of the founders of Greenwood or Black Wall Street, including O.W. Gurley, uh, who was also considered one of the first Black millionaires in the United States at the time. And so obviously oil was a big part of the reason a lot of people came to Oklahoma and to Tulsa, but also there was a lot of um, dynamic cultures. Jazz was definitely uh, starting to become very popular and you could see sort of the migration of jazz uh, through um, New Orleans, Texas to Oklahoma and even to Tulsa, which was known to have a thriving entertainment uh, district as well. Um, perhaps might be illegal <laughs> today, but it, it was definitely a place to be. And the thing to understand about Tulsa during this period is that while there was so much promise, it didn't mean it wasn't without um, wasn't without obstacles for African Americans. Discrimination and racism was still very real. It was still very much a threat. And it's also important to note that this was a period of near lawlessness in a lot of places. There was a lot of vigilante justice happening in which sometimes people would take the law into their own hand. Other times you'd have, you know, a sheriff's deputy or uh, a law enforcement, high ranking law enforcement official basically deputize regular citizens and say, okay, go out and, and, and get this person or, you know, enforce justice. And so um, this was, this meant it was still very dangerous for African Americans to exist during this time because they were not treated as first class citizens, no matter how much money they had. And because they were not treated as first class citizens, they also did not have full protection under the law. So creating safe communities was very important um, and vital to um, African American, uh, the Af African American culture, just in terms of survival. And so you can see here, sometimes people have like this weird <laughs> a perception of Black Wall Street, like people were just dripping in gold and opulence. This is a community really of working class people. And the reason we emphasize prosperity when we talk about Black Wall Street is because it was only several decades since slavery had ended. So it was quite a feat for African-Americans to be able to literally pull themselves up by their bootstraps and make a life and a living for themselves. When you're talking about economic independence, there were a lot of obstacles that stood in the way of Black people. And not just with racism and discrimination, but laws and policies that were enacted to make it harder for Black people to exist or to, to make it so that they had to depend on the farming class or the ruling class uh, for their livelihood and, and really could never pull themselves um, out of poverty. So this is an example of a house in the Greenwood district uh, around the time before the Tulsa race massacre happened. Quite lovely, even by today's standards. But again, important to recognize that these were mostly working class people. Here's a, a picture of some of the pioneers. This is John and Lola Williams. Their son, W.D. Williams, is also heavily quoted 
when we talk about Black Wall Street, he gave his accounts of his experience in the Tulsa Race Massacre. So let's get to the Tulsa Race Massacre. I'm gonna skip over some of this uh, history there. Uh, essentially, one of the things that I try to help people understand is, again, what was happening in America when this happened. So how is it even possible that a beautiful community like this could be destroyed? So Ida B. Wells, a very famous investigative journalist and researcher, she is famous for her research on lynching in America. And she actually went to the site of a lot of lynchings, interviewed people, was one of the first investigative reporters during this time, and realized that lynching was was another tool uh, that was used to essentially stifle the uh, socioeconomic growth of Black people. It wasn't just used uh, for fear, but really it was used to scare Black people out of trying to rise above their stations in life. And one of the common uh, things that was employed when it came to lynching was to accuse a Black man of assaulting or harming a white woman. And so this is essentially what happened in Tulsa. There was a young man about 19 years old by the name of uh, Dick Rowland. He was known as Diamond Dick uh, as well among his peers. He was a shoeshine man and he worked downtown in Tulsa proper and he uh, was in an elevator. Now, black people at the time were not really allowed to use the bathrooms in the predominantly white area of Tulsa, but he had worked down there. So he knew where he could use a bathroom should he need to go. And that's what he did one day, May 30th of 1921. He went inside of the Drexel building in downtown Tulsa to use the bathroom. And when he was on the elevator, there was a white elevator operator, a young lady by the name of Sarah Page. She was merely a teenager at the time. And the story goes, that somehow the elevator lurched and Dick fell forward and fell into Sarah at the time. So remember, very tense race relations happening in the country. So Sarah screamed, a nearby store clerk came and ran over and basically assumed that Dick Rowland had assaulted or attempted to assault Sarah. And black men knew very well what could happen to them if they were accused of doing such a thing. So Dick Rowland ran from that uh, elevator and that building, presumably ran home, was arrested the next day and soon word spread that he tried to attack this white lady. I mean, just almost like a firestorm. It did not help that some of the newspapers at the time who engaged in really unscrupulous measures like yellow journalism kind of fanned the flames of this fire. And uh, by the next day, you had this lynch mob that had formed outside the jail where Dick was being held to essentially lynch him. And at the time, you had a lot of uh, Black folks who, uh, here in Tulsa, a lot of World War I veterans who had served overseas. And so they were not as uh, inclined to lie down, perhaps some as their perhaps some as some of their forefathers had done and just submit and they decided we you know they were tired of seeing lynchings they did not want to see any more people lynched so they had gathered around the jail to sort of protect Dick Rowland well you can imagine the sight of a bunch of black men with guns uh, in Oklahoma at the time it was unsettling and essentially a confrontation broke out and Suddenly, the lynch mob turned their attention away from uh, Mr. Rowland and towards the Black section of Tulsa, and that was Black Wall Street, and descended upon the community and simply burned it to the ground, shot and killed as many people as they could, and in the process, looted uh, from a lot of homes, stole whatever they could. And again, we're talking about some prosperous African Americans, so you would see uh, looters and members of the mob walking out with entire bags of goods and fur coats and all kinds of things. And uh, this is not hyperbole, this is uh, witness testimony. And so uh, in a period of less than 24 hours, the entire community at 35 block uh, community was burned to the ground. Really nothing was left. And in the days that followed, uh, the survivors were interned at a, a field ground not far away and basically you know, held prisoner until uh, perhaps a white employer could come and vouch for them and get them released. One of the things I try to help people understand uh, with regards to this story a lot of times people think that's where the story ends, but that's not the case. Um, over the next several years, 
uh, Tulsans, Black Tulsans in particular, rebuilt Black Wall Street. And it actually was more prosperous in its second iteration than it was the first time around. And that's important to note because simply of the sheer resilience, you know, that folks had to have. This is a, a picture of, of the massacre as it's happening. And so you can imagine um, what it took to uh, rebuild a community in that way. And eventually uh, the community did uh, succumb socioeconomically uh, some decades later, uh, largely due to desegregation and other um, policies that were harmful to that community. But I love to emphasize the fact that Black Wall Street was rebuilt. It did not burn forever in the flames of the massacre. And I think that's a good segue into getting into tonight's discussion when we talk about Black wealth, Black resilience, what it takes to build that, what it took to build back then, how difficult it was back then and how difficult uh, it remains today. So I'd like to, uh, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here and I'm gonna turn it back uh, uh, towards our esteemed group of panelists um, that have joined us this evening and, and, uh, and everybody else who's also joined us this evening. And, you know, I guess I just would like folks to just think about, um, you know, in your own lives, what images you associate with black wealth, what images you think of when you think of black wealth. And we all know that being a black person in America kind of runs the gamut, right? So you can be very, very wealthy, you can be very, very unwealthy. And, but when we talk about being industrious, a lot of times, um, you know, black wealth isn't included in these conversations. So I think that's why it's really important uh, that we're having these conversations tonight. So um, I'm gonna start with, uh, I'm gonna start with Melissa actually. And Melissa, um, you are an entrepreneur, you're an investor, you're a professor. What role do you think entrepreneurship and venture capital play in building wealth in the black community today? Well, thank you for having me, and, and I really appreciate um, the grounding that you provided. I, I have come to learn as we come upon the 100th anniversary uh, that I was privileged to understand the history of, of Black Wall Street, so, so thank you for sharing. Um, I had a conversation the other day with someone, and I said, I think the two significant pillars, and please, anyone, feel free to debate me, but the two significant pillars I see in the Black community are politics and financial empowerment and wealth creation. Um, I think that it is clear um, that our black wealth creation opportunities cause a threat to others, hence we saw the burning down and I think we still see uh, in a different type of burning down, not literally but figuratively the chipping away of, of the assets that we acquire and systems that were designed not to include us uh, or to make sure we got locked out, i.e. the stock market. But when you live in a capitalist society, I think it is inherently important that you are able to manage assets and structural racism has shown that we have not. Uh, the GI Bill did not include us to have home ownership, which has been a pillar of economic wealth creation. Uh, we know that most people, but certainly not black people, are, are in Wall Street, uh, are on the stock market, because oftentimes until you had a lot of these apps, the ability to weigh in uh, or buy in was, was a little too high for folks based on our average uh, income and net worth. So I think it's important that we find entrepreneurship and, and pass the wealth creation like what Donahue was doing to make sure that we actually have our own capital to fund our own institutions, to fund our own movements, and to fund our leaders. Uh, there's a gentleman, Emmett Dennis, who is the brother of Rich Dennis, who sold Shea Moisture, I'm sorry, cousin, who said uh, the Black Revolution must be financed. Uh, and so I think it's important that we lose a sense of power and autonomy uh, and ability to do what we want if we are incumbent upon or beholden to somebody else to give us the financial access. So I think that's extremely important. In my conversation today, though, I'm, I'm realistic that money doesn't solve everything. Uh, money is a means to be able to shift processes, create new paradigms, but we do indeed need politics and policy to be able to implement and concretize that which we come up with. It is the persistent structural racism due to the lack of any effort or work on behalf of our legislators that allow these systems to lock us out. And so I think it's important for us to get our own, to have our own assets, to have our own wealth, to be able to support our institutions that are doing amazing work and to have the capital. And then at the same time, be able to support legislators who believe in our agenda so that the structural barriers when these gentlemen uh, back then, nothing happened to them. Just like I live in DC, five blocks from the Capitol, 
a lot of nothing happened to those people who were CEOs and investors when they caused a riot and tried to literally overturn democracy. And so we do need to have the political power and clout to allow us to be able to maneuver and make permanent changes to systems so that once that wealth is accumulated, it actually is sustained and thrives within our community. Thank you so much, Melissa. All right, so our next question is for Donahue. Donahue, you are the founder of a fintech startup. I'd like you to share the motivation behind launching Money Avenue LLC and how uh, you think the intersection of financial access and technology to build wealth uh, manifests itself today. Yeah, one of the <clears throat> key principles that we wanted to overcome is kind of closing the wealth gap. And what, what we set out to do was really provide ownership, either through two means of doing it, either through uh, owning land, which is real estate, or through owning a business, which is being an entrepreneur. And that's really what our, our basis of our company is built on, providing a pathway to either home ownership or entrepreneurship. So, you know, a lot of the way that we do it is basically six principles. We basically believe that everyone at this particular time, we live in the wealthiest country at the wealthiest time in human history, that everyone should be at least a thousandaire that we call, we call a thousandaire, someone that's capable of making at least a hundred thousand dollars a year through our partners. We have programs that we can guarantee that happening. One of our partners has a training program, no college education required, not even a high school education required. They have a three month training program that if you take the three month program, they guarantee you a salary of at least $100,000 in uh, encoding technology, right? So our whole vision is really to marry technology with a, a piece of the pie, piece of that wealth creation process that's taken place in Silicon Valley. If Silicon Valley was a country all to itself, it would be one of the most wealthiest countries in the, in the world, literally. So our goal is to create more entrepreneurs, more real estate developers. We want people to be creators. We want them to own a piece of the earth. That's really where it's at, it's ownership. That is the key. And technology plays a significant part in that. And if you're not, in, if you're not involved with that, you're gonna be left behind. And that's why we try to increase the financial literacy of all of our clients or all of, when we do lectures, or every time we try to tell them that if you have a business and you're not tied into technology, you will be left behind and somebody will be eating your cake. I don't like anybody eating my cake and I definitely don't like <laughs> Uh, so thank you for that uh, apt analogy. Our next question is for Stephanie. You have studied the importance of teaching children and wealth creation, investing, and entrepreneurship. What do you believe are the most important things to instill in the next generation to build and maintain wealth? Yes, well, thank you so much for having me. I've, I've certainly am so happy to be here and privileged to be with this group. It's not the group of people who I normally spend my time talking to. I'm a diversity scholar and most of my work is focused on mature organizations and corporate diversity practices. But, you know, there some interesting overlaps have been happening in my life in the last um, year as I've been doing research on things like corporate diversity practices. I've, I've become um, interested and intrigued in, in various leaders that we have in the black community in um, corporate America. And many of them have stories with ties to black Wall Street. And so I started to learn some of those stories. And one person um, with whom I've been collaborating over the last years who has one of these stories is, is John Rogers, who's founder and co-CEO of Aerial Investments. And, and this becomes, a, I think, a very interesting story as tied also to my interest in building wealth through youth, because a lot of this has been, um, I've engaged in this topic through my work with him. But anyway, I'm not sure how many people know John Rogers' story. So in addition to just being such a, a fantastic human who's, who's singularly dedicated to building wealth in the Black community, he also is the great grandson of J.B. Stratford, who owned the Stratford Hotel on Greenwood Avenue. And, and his great grandfather, J.B. Stratford, was actually born into slavery in Kentucky. Um, and so if you Google John, you'll find this story. It's really fascinating. But as I was listening to John talk about this story really recently, he talked about how um, his family became even more deeply 
deeply invested in building black communities um, through the legacy of you know, civil rights, but also in becoming lawyers because of what had happened to them. And I think for John, as I've been talking to him and we've been doing some work focused on building wealth in, in black communities, for him, a lot of this manifests in youth. So through Ariel Investments, his firm, they have a program called Ariel Community Academy in the South Side of Chicago. And it's such a fascinating um, program that's built on financial education. So, so much of what Donahue was talking about is, is, a, is a program that exists through the school. So the way that it works is, so it recognizes the fact that black people are underinvested in, in the stock market and that equities um, appreciate at, at much greater rates than things like home ownership. And many of us have, are pressed to buy homes. And that's a great thing, but it's not appreciating at the same level as our investments in, in, in equities. And so what this Aerial Community Academy does is it allows kids to have the opportunity to, um, to view a $20,000 investment that every kid's class coming in has starting at the first grade. They watch it grow. And then by the sixth through eighth grade, they use portion of this $20,000 portfolio to build and to, to buy stocks. Um, upon graduation from the Aerial Community Academy in the eighth grade, the profits are divided in half. One half is given back to the school as a gift and the other half is distributing amongst the graduates as cash or thing or, or money that they can contribute to things like college savings plans, 529, which are obviously invested in capital markets. Um, and so the interesting thing about this program is not only are the kids learning to play with real money and to invest real money, they're also learning things that I never learned until, I don't even wanna tell you when I started learning about these things, but they, they learn, they have their fifth area of subject um, that they take. So they take the standard four subjects that every kid in Chicago has to take in order to, you know, go, matriculate through school. Their fifth subject is financial education, and it covers investing, entrepreneurship, personal finance, and economics. And imagine that. Imagine if more Black children started to learn about these principles and early on. And, and I think what's so great about this program and where they're seeing some early success is the children beginning to take some of those lessons home to their black families and talking about financial education, talking about investing in stocks, talking about entrepreneurship. So I'm really passionate about this initiative because I do believe that you know anybody can learn. If I, I wouldn't be a professor if I didn't believe that anybody could learn, but I also do believe that we have to invest in our youth if we're actually gonna build a wealth in black communities. Thank you so much, Dr. Creary. Um, I hope I can call you Dr. Creary, Stephanie. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> you can call me Stephanie. That's fine. <laughs> okay. I believe people should use the title if you went through all that to get it. So, but um, I, I'm so glad you mentioned J.B. Stratford. I have a very short story about him, if I can be permitted to tell it very quickly, because it's important. He was actually born a slave. I've interviewed several of his family members. And as you mentioned, he is widely considered to be one of the uh, founders of Black Wall Street of Tulsa Greenwood. Um, now, as Melissa mentioned earlier, accurately, so Tulsans, though they were not responsible for burning down their own community, nobody was held accountable. In fact, the blame started shifting to the Blacks uh, in Greenwood after a while, basically saying they shouldn't have stood up for themselves. And so Stratford, he was one of several people who were indicted for in essentially starting the riot. Now he jumped bail and left Tulsa and then fled to Kansas, where he was briefly jailed before his son, who was actually an attorney living and working in Chicago at the time, secured his freedom and then took him back to Chicago. Stratford Bradford was one of the lucky ones. He was able to rebuild his life um, in Chicago as a, an attorney, which he was also, and an entrepreneur. But the charge of rioting hung over his head until the day he died. And it wasn't until years later, after a descendant of his fought very hard, that Stratford's record on October uh, in 1996, 75 years after the Tulsa Race Massacre, was cleared. And that happened during a ceremony. Um, and, you know, this is just one example of what I like to call, you know, uh, justice delayed is justice denied. So who, who knows what would have happened if he was able to uh, have his record clear while he was still alive. But let's go on um, and continue on here with our panel discussion. And um, I'd like to turn the discussion to uh, Donahue again. You operate an Angle Syndicate. Can you share more about how, excuse me, 
angel syndicate. Can you please share more about how angel investing can be used as a tool for wealth creation? Yeah, one of the great things about uh, the about our company and what we tried to do is that we're surrounded by creators all the time. There's so much creativity that exists within our community. And what we really wanted to do was we didn't have a bunch of money, but we had a little bit of money. And we wanted to help more entrepreneurs get to the next level. We wanted to help entrepreneurs kind of tap in to that wealth creation vehicle that exists in Silicon Valley and, and all over, right? Even Atlanta has a hub that's going on right now that's it's really thriving. But the whole thing is that a lot of it is, is separating, a lot of what is separating entrepreneurs from tapping into that is education, right? How do you structure your business? How are you accounting for it? Really, what does the financials, what's the story of the financials? What is that telling, right? And how could you, how do you see the vision and how do you position that, right? So what we wanted to do was kind of just give the, give the entrepreneur a small investment. We, we basically, we've invested in three startups and we basically just give them enough money, the friends and family round. We usually probably a hundred, maybe 200 max, right? And then to help them to get to a series A, that's the ultimate goal. It's just startup money. Cause a lot of the startups that we, that we know today started with friends and family, you know, they started with the mother, father, aunt, somebody that can invest in them in our community we don't have a lot of people in our community that have 200, 300 grand to invest in a startup and say, well, does it, is it, could, could it succeed? Could it not? It would probably devastate the family. So really our goal is to be that resource for those companies that need the help to get to the next level, going from ideation all the way to product market fit. That's the goal. Thank you so much um, for that. You know, angel investing is certainly not something that we hear when we talk about black wealth. So um, that's a really unique perspective you have there. Um, this question goes back to Stephanie. Black Wall Street was obviously very vibrant in part because of the strong social capital within the black community. Um, could you just share your thoughts on why developing strong personal and professional ties within the black community can help foster wealth creation broadly? Yes, I, absolutely. As an organizational scholar, a person who studies work more broadly, I can tell you that's the quintessential key to success in any career field. So whether we're talking about you becoming number one at Goldman Sachs, to you becoming number one at Wendy's, to you becoming number one entrepreneur, the amount of social capital that you have and how you leverage that is certainly vitally important. But the interesting part is to think about social capital and how it's um, gained and accessed and utilized in entrepreneurship and how that might be a little bit different from your job at, at Goldman Sachs, right? So uh, arguably um, in many corporate organizations, established corporate organizations, there, there at least is a manager. There's somebody who is checking in with you to see how you're doing. Now they may or may not be good and they may not be advocating or sponsoring for you, but sponsoring you, but there are some structures um, that dictate uh, or that allow you to have a little bit of social capital. Um, that's not true for most entrepreneurs. For most entrepreneurs, it's the hustle day in and day out and tapping into different communities that exist. So there is a difference to how you gain um, and, and sort of the road ahead with respect to being able to gain social capital and entrepreneurship that's slightly different from if your day job is in an organization which there's sort of hierarchical management structures. So um, interestingly enough, there is a, a, an article that was published a few years ago in an academic journal that was looking at this idea of community social capital and entrepreneurship. Again, this idea that if we have a collection of people who have social capital, will that predict your success, my success as an entrepreneur? And so they actually look at social capital in terms of the trust that can be developed within a community because people give each other essentially the benefit of the doubt because they seem to seemingly, at least on the surface level, share a common set of values. And because there's this trust, they exchange information, money, ideas, support, much more freely than when this social capital, i.e. trust, doesn't exist. Now that is the good news, right? So the bad news, and I was really sad when I read this in this article, is that it's working better currently for white entrepreneurs than it is for black entrepreneurs. Why is that the case? 
because our social capital as black people is often not valued in the same way, either socially or financially in the same way that white people's uh, social capital is value. And so it means that although this idea of community social capital and in creating that as a community of black people um, can help to build wealth, it's not in and of itself alone isn't going to close the gaps. So there's a difference between building some wealth and there's a difference between closing the gaps, the, the racial wealth gap. So in addition to building community social capital, we need to be looking at other mechanisms. And, and Melissa and, and Donahue were talking about all the other ways in which we can build wealth uh, above, above and beyond um, this idea of creating community social capital. Thank you so much. And uh, I just wanna remind the panelists, so we've got some questions that people are posting. And if you have some time in between answering the questions that I'm asking you, uh, perhaps you can also answer the questions that some of our guests who have uh, tuned in to hear you speak tonight can answer. And I'm glad you mentioned social capital because really quickly, one of the things that I think is important to mention about Black Wall Street or Greenwood is that it became prosperous because Black people in Tulsa were not allowed to frequent downtown Tulsa or the white area of Tulsa uh, freely. They really couldn't, they could shop, sure, they could spend their money, but they really weren't welcomed, right? And so it was, while an integrated community, it was still very segregated. And because this is obviously problematic when you're trying to just exist, Black people ended up figuring out a way to create their own insular economy in which they would support one another. And so you had various entrepreneurs and business people who would patronize one another, other Black entrepreneurs and business people in Black Wall Street. And so much so that the dollars continued to circulate and circulate and circulate within Black Wall Street so much that they used to say you never really had to travel outside of Tulsa and, and the Greenwood section in order to get anything that you really needed. And so the, the irony in the, that it was burned down, a lot of people believe, not really because people were angry that this Black man reportedly assaulted this woman, but because they didn't think Black people had the right to have nice things or even should have nice things. They thought it threatened their, uh, their social ideology and their way of life. But the irony in that is, this was uh, an economy that was created out of necessity because of the racism that existed during the day. And they paid the price because they figured out a way to live in spite of it. So I'm gonna move on um, to another question here uh, for our panelists. This is the actual last question. Um, I. No, second to last, because I have a surprise question. But this question is for Melissa. We are at the 100 year anniversary of the Tulsa Race Massacre. What do you think is the most important lesson that we should all take from that history? There, there's a few, but let me try and weave together so that the most important is the couple. I, I think one, I, I was uh, fascinated and really appreciative of your opening in that there were so many things you mentioned that are still here uh, today. Uh, when you talked about the rich, the richness of the area, I, I may get myself in trouble on this one, uh, but let's be clear, people recognize the richness of the inner city and take advantage of it. Hence, Michael Porter, ICIC, the university, and he understood the value of ICIC and inner cities and no one else did, and now people are concerned. Um, you also talked about um, you know, just the ongoing brutality, et cetera, which obviously we see today, hence post-George Floyd and many others before that. So, so 100 years, you know, my, my hope is that there is a call to action that says 100 years, we have not seen much progress on the side of those who are oppressors or those who control the purse strings or those who run the institutions. And this is our time to really get grounded in history and understand what we had, understand how we had it and recognize that it can indeed be recreated. I, I, I've been watching the chat and I, I think that Donahue and, and Dr. Cray would agree with me. There is nothing that we're covering today that is rocket science. There is nothing that we are covering today that, that my kids, your kids can't grasp. Uh, it is just access. And so this has been an amazing platform to provide that access. And I will speak for myself. I am happy to be accessible to anyone thereafter. Um, but I think that uh, Kwabina, if I'm saying that right, it is, yeah, one is it's a mindset. I think we have been locked out of history. Um, I certainly am very well aware, but also as a finance major and someone who loves black history was very well aware of Tulsa, but was amazed by the surprise when the Watchmen came out that people didn't know about it. And I think some of that is intentional, 
our school districts don't teach it. It's not, it's not even covered in black history. It is a scar that people hope will go away. And so I think one is indeed uh, the mindset, the exposure and the education. The second thing is community. Uh, this is a great start. I'm thrilled to see 155 people on this and I hope that somehow we figure out how to build community from this because not a single one of us can overcome what, what has been put in front of us alone. And so we can only be stronger if we all come together. And I think the distinct nature of uh, a, a member of the academy and someone who obviously is a fellow Hoya who, who is just a brother, but also interested in finance and I probably do a whole bunch of stuff that, that we all come together and recognize and this is not a geographic thing. This is not a sector thing. This is not a class thing. This is a black thing. And, and we all need to get our act together. And then the final thing is this is only going to work if we invest in ourselves. Um, you know, I have my kids, thanks to all these apps, have been investing since they were five. Uh, and, and we don't invest in things just because it's popular. We invest in things that we believe are going to support our community. And I only now, since COVID, I probably should have done it sooner, only wear t-shirts that are created by Black entrepreneurs I, that I know are people send to me. We have got to figure out how, what the uniqueness of Tulsa that you alluded to is the recycling of wealth within that community. It takes less than 10 seconds for a dollar to last in the Black community. So if we do not figure out how to corral our own resources, and not necessarily be isolationist, but be siloistic and community oriented and prioritizing our community before others, this is not going to happen. Well said. I'm so glad you mentioned the fact that a lot of people were not aware of what Tosa was, the significance of its history until Watchmen came out, because it, you're right, it was deliberate. And what I try to convey to people when I talk about this subject is that Tulsa was a microcosm of what was happening in America at the time. This was not just one horrible, horrendous massacre that happened. There were dozens upon dozens upon dozens of Tulsa race massacres. Now, most of them were not as severe as the Tulsa race massacre, but, you know, simply talk about the red summer of 1919, right? No less than 25 so-called, what they called at the time, race riots, but, now we more uh, appropriately call them uh, massacres, happened in between the spring and the fall of that year alone. And in, in addition to massacres, there were other ways to destabilize Black communities, what was called white capping, in which some white cappers initially, essentially uh, went into these communities and essentially threatened them with violence or death and told them, you have to leave or you'll die. And by the way, we're going to take your land. And then if they didn't comply, well, they would still some people would be beaten or killed or worse. They started off as a way to really control the market um, and the price of cotton, and they would really bully a lot of farmers, but then they realized this was a tool they could use to take wealth away from Black people. So this has been happening to our communities for well over 100 years, and much of this history is suppressed deliberately. Imagine what people would do and what habits they might adopt that are beneficial and what things they might change about their lives if they knew that things were done deliberately and violently to keep them from rising above their station in life. So my question, final question to all of the panelists, and I'll start with you, Donahue. Um, I'm a storyteller. I'm not a financial expert like all of you all, but I am a storyteller. And I believe in telling this history because it has been deliberately suppressed. So my question to you is, Donahue, Stephanie, and Melissa, what do you think the importance of learning about this history is for the Black community? And how do you think learning about this history, creating awareness about it, can help us improve our financial situation as a community? Well, yeah, I think that it's very important to know the history so we can understand the future. That's really the, the key, right? Understand that these systems that exist within our country today are really exist to keep us out. So we have to play a different game. We have to play the game and follow the playbook of the wealthy and be unapologetic about it. So one of the things that, that I talk about um, to my class and we study Donald Trump, mainly not only because he was a, you know, he's risen through the presidency, but he's kind of put himself in a position where he's mastered kind of uh, business credit and he's allowed to, I mean, he has over 500 
LLCs. And he's leveraged the power of those LLCs. And he's, we know for a fact that he's filed for bankruptcy over four times, but it's never affected his personal credit. But the key to understand is that he's able to set up these separate legal entities and leverage them for millions and millions of dollars. And despite the fact that his father, Fred Trump, and gave him millions of dollars to start his career and funded a lot of it, he's still able to not use his wealth to build his, his companies. And a lot of what I try to do to my students is give them that knowledge, improve their financial literacy. Understand that if you have a million dollars in a bank account, the wealthy do not just have their money sitting in a bank account, they put it to work. And if you put your, if you, if you just leave it in an account, we know that five years down the road, that money is gonna be devalued. Right. So we have to understand these things. We have to improve our financial literacy. We have to know how to get access to capital the same way the wealthy do. Right. We have to know all of these things, put them to use. And that is going to that's how we've learned from history. Right. So one of the one of the um, one of my my uh, favorite books is a, a book by Reginald Lewis called uh, The White Guy Shouldn't Have All the Fun. But I mean, you know, just his life in general and what he went through in the 70s to build his company and the story, the, his trajectory, a lot of it could be applied to what's going on in corporate America today because it hasn't changed. So it's very important for us to understand our history so we can learn from it and continue to grow as a community in the future. Stephanie, Dr. Creary, how about you? Yeah, so interestingly enough, I, you know, reflect on the fact that I didn't know about uh, Black Wall Street until recently. And, and I think much more I've learned as I've had you know, John as my collaborator and learned about his family. And I'm trying to figure out why that is the case. Um, you know, I went to school in the 80s and the 90s and I grew up out West where when you get outside of the basic US history that many of us know, much of it becomes regional history. So I learned about the gold rush and the silver rush and things like that. So it, it, it's, it helps me to understand why I might not know about what's happening in Oklahoma, right? But I also you know, question why is it that I don't know about that black people excelled and have excelled um, at different points in history. Um, and and it, it strikes me back to a conversation that I had in the last few years with a person who is a director, a corporate director of a textbook company. So a for-profit com corporation that makes tech textbooks. And she told me straight out how they have all these conversations um, in the boardroom around to what extent do they get involved in helping management understand that history and, and sort of what they're selling in their textbook does to some extent, a large extent, if you will, um, dictates what children feel is possible. And so if all you're learning about your history is that you were oppressed and you've never learned that people who look like you were successful on Black Wall Street, then it becomes very hard to aspire. That said, I'm gonna take it to the kids. Again, is I think it's so important as we're thinking about children, um, this idea, you know, the black community for so long has taken care of its own. And I'm always afraid at different points in time that we start to lose that connection um, but I do know that as we're thinking about social capital and I'm looking at some of the, the hope that I have in our kids future with respect to becoming um, invested in the same economy that white people are with accessing education the same way that white people are, that, that things might be changing. There was a question in the chat earlier that was um, rightfully suggesting that education is expensive and, and many people, including myself, have graduated with extensive amounts of uh, uh, student loan debt. You don't get five degrees. Well, I didn't get five degrees um, for free, right? There, there's some cost and some own some money to, the, to the, the government. I've been crossing my fingers that they're gonna cancel some of that, but I won't fall into that bucket. Nevertheless, what's interesting is I wanna tell you about another program that is taking on this idea of, you know, education is important. It doesn't have to be a graduate school. It doesn't have to be a four-year institution, but when you, educate people, even if it's through vocational school, you help them to see a greater set of possibilities than maybe they might see if they were just looking at their immediate surroundings. So that's why school becomes important. And that's why what we teach kids in school becomes important is it broadens their mindset. 
So one more program I want to tell you about because I interviewed this group recently and I just thought that they were so fascinating. Never heard of them, but it's this program called New York City Kids Rise and it's called the Save for College program. And it was this program that was launched in 2017 with a $10 million donation from the Gray Foundation. And Mr. Gray is actually the COO of Blackstone, the president and COO of Blackstone. Um, and so it's an interesting public-private community partnership. And so in this, it's about partnering with this, the, the New York uh, State Department of Education, partnering with the Gray Foundation and investors, but also the communities in which these kids learn to provide them with more financial resources to go to college. So what this program is, is it's currently helping more than 13,000 students across 39 public schools um, in Western Queens, New York, build assets for their future. So every kid who is um, engaged or starts enrolling in one of these schools, they automatically get $100 put into a New York uh, 529 college savings account. Um, and again, 529, that money is invested in capital markets. And what they're seeing now through this program is that each kid can uh, minimally graduate high school with $3,000. And so we talked a little bit about what does $3,000 mean. And what I told them is $3,000 can mean a lot to people who cannot rely on parents or family members for tuition. I, I told them that, you know, as a first generation college student, my parents didn't have any money. And I remember my senior year of college having a $2,000 tuition bill and being really afraid that I was not going to finish my senior year of college. And it was through my Black friends that I was able to pull enough resources to finish college. And what I love about this New York uh, Kids Save for College program is it's the same idea of people who are Black pooling resources um, to help. So it also, it's a program that, you know, I don't want to be remiss in saying it's only for Black kids. It's actually the predominant um, ethnicity of people who, who are in this area are Hispanic Latinx. But there's this really interesting example of the Astoria housing community. So the projects in, um, in Queens where it's predominantly Black. And those residents raised an additional $184,000 for these kids for education. So I guess it goes without saying that I think it's important to invest in kids. I think it's important to teach them about finance. I think it's important for communities to continue and black communities to continue to feel responsibility for all of these children. Uh, Melissa, I will let you have the last word there. Thank you. Um, I, I guess I, I was trying to be succinct because I'm mindful of time. <clears throat> um, I think there's a few things that I would say in terms of if I think I'm, if I'm answering the question as I remember it, which is where do we go from here <clears throat> and what is the opportunity to kind of leverage this? I think one is self-education. Um, I, I was checking the chat and, and I am embarrassed for us as a country and a school system that somebody who lived in Tulsa did not know about Tulsa. And so we can no longer rely on the institutions that are said to serve us to help us and protect us. I think we saw that. Uh, and we see that on a regular basis with the police. Uh, I think we've got to figure out how to self-educate. And I think there are tons of work, tons of resources by black people, for black people. Uh, and again, just plugging ourselves in places, whether it's on Facebook or Twitter or Clubhouse or wherever, um, to really just educate ourselves, uh, both history so that we don't repeat it in a negative way and also what's happening right now. Because unfortunately, a lot of this history is repeating itself. Um, the second thing is I wanted to shout out to Yannick. I hope I'm saying your name right, that this is bigger than us, meaning the US. Um, this is a global movement. I had the privilege, I think like every, uh, I'll say privileged black person uh, to go to Ghana last year in the year of the return. Uh, I mean, that was a big deal. I think it was a big deal psychologically. It was a big deal for my family and for my kids, but I think it was a big deal for all the black people who were on the plane. It was a plane full of black people that we didn't know each other, uh, but we nat naturally have that kindred spirit. And it was like, we're going home. Now we didn't really know if they were gonna welcome us. We didn't know we were going home too, we were going home. And I think we need to maintain that level of excitement and enthusiasm of going across and recognizing there are black people all over the world. Um, and, and certainly since COVID a lot more intentionally leaving the United States um, to hopefully find more, more pleasant places. So we've got to think global. The other thing I would say is um, I'm, I'm also watching the chat and I think some things we've covered uh, in, in many webinars I've been on around, particularly around financial economic empowerment for black people. Um, it's like, oh, that sounds like a lot. Oh, that's too much. And, and I think the biggest thing is just, you know, start now and be consistent. 
Um, we are not going to eradicate over a thousand years of oppression and 400 years since we've been free and still not really being free. We're not going to solve that in a year. Like, like 20, it's just not going to happen. And, and, and as somebody who's over 50, I recognize anything I do is not about me. It is about the future generations, not just my kids, but everybody's. And so I think we need to start now uh, and be patient and, and be consistent in what we do. Um, and the final thing I would say is um, challenge each other and challenge ourselves. I think we naturally tend to um, look for partnerships with people who may not be aligned. Um, I, am, I, I may get myself in trouble. I may not be invited back, but not all skin folk are kinfolk. And so let's not make assumptions. Um, do your diligence. Uh, not everybody is deeply is, is deeply invested in our economic pathway to wealth and prosperity as we may seem. Not, not disparaging anybody, but I think there are some that are more well-intentioned than others, some who are more eager than others. We're gonna need them all to get across. But I think we just want to be mindful in terms of who we pick to lead and guide our work and hopefully bring others along. Um, but I think we have to honor and, and own that we are a, a complex community. Uh, we come with our own biases, our own prejudices. We, we, are not, uh, we are not immune from that which has oppressed us. And so we probably have to do some self-reflection and some self-healing first as a community. And, and let me just say, I'm not a woo-woo person, uh, but I think that's important um, because otherwise I, I run the risk that we will leave the wrong people behind, we will run people over and we'll perpetuate some of the stuff that we see now. But I think if we can get back to just the personification of Tulsa, that people who didn't know each other, willing to work together, risking their lives, going out to save their community. If we could do that uh, and, and manifest what we saw from the Rodney King riots to the racial insurrection, and we are able to come together with no questions asked and on a level of faith and trust and bound by unity, protect and serve our communities, I think we're going to be okay. Oh, there was so much truth in that. And thank you so much. And I hope that year of the return to Ghana is like replicated in 2022 because COVID just ruined everything in 2020. So <laughs> I will turn this back over to Samer. Um, thank you so much for our panelists and thank you for having me. This was a great discussion. I, I agree with you there. I'll buy my ticket right now. Um, but thank you everybody, Melissa, Nia, Donahue, Stephanie. Um, I learned so much during this conversation. Uh, I'm embarrassed to say how little I knew about Black Wall Street in Tulsa prior to this year. So I, I think this conversation was very relevant and important. Uh, so I just want to thank you all for joining us today. Um, for everybody that attended, we'll be sharing the, the recording as well as some of the resources and the LinkedIn's of the speakers to follow up. And we'll continue to have these conversations, you know, and then I think we, we need to continue to reinforce the importance of and connection to Black wealth creation through all these tools that were mentioned uh, today on the chat. So thank you everybody for joining us, taking the time, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your days.